27. Oh, 
I got a goodie bag. Oh, yeah. But you know what? It's actually a puzzle. And I'm going to show you some things, and you're going to tell me what they've got in common. All right? All right. Here we go. And you guys might like to have a think as well. All right, here we go. What's that? That's a belt. You've got one? Oh, it's not yours. I didn't pinch yours, I promise. <laughs> so if Steve's pants fall down, it's in it. Because <laughs> I've got his belt. What about this one? All right, so that one's a shirt. Oh, yeah, one of Steve's shirts. Very bright. I wonder who gave him this shirt. Uh, all right, so that's a shirt. You want the same one? Okay. Uh, Oh, the bag. The bag. Okay. So now we have a belt, a shirt, and a bag. What have they got in common? A shop nut. Wrong. Ding dong. No, got nothing to do with my husband. What do you reckon, Indy? No, they're not all used for something. They've got colour. Uh, they have got colour, but no. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. It's got nothing to do with his trousers. All right, I'm going to give you one more clue. Piece of bacon. <laughs> so now we have a belt, a shirt, a piece of bacon, and two plastic bags. What have they got in common? Have I got you all stumped? <laughs> Yay! That... Sorry? No, nothing to do with the food bank. I'll, sh all right, I'll show you what they've all got in common. Salt. They've all got salt in common. Still got some really blank faces. Necessities, no, salt, no, it's actually salt. So, salt is used for curing leather. Okay, so there's the belt. Let's put it back in here. Salt is used for setting dyes so that we can have colourful shirts. So there we go, salt. Salt is for preserving food. And salt is used in the manufacture of plastic bags. Don't ask me how. I looked it up. That's what it said. I believed it. So salt is used for all those things. What do you use salt for in your house, Indy? Eating. So I think most of us think about salt as being part of our food, don't we? So you know how I often talk about how Jesus says some really weird things and sometimes we have to have a bit of a think about what it really means for us because it doesn't make a lot of sense if you just look at it. At the very end of today's reading, it says salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, with what will you flavour it? So salt's only good so long as it's salty and so long as it does what we want it to do but earlier in another book in the in the gospel of matthew jesus talks to us about us being the salt of the earth we are the salt of the earth now just like we think about salt as being used in our food sometimes we think about being a christian as just coming to church don't we that's what being a christian's all that's about coming to church but Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth. So that means that just like salt does all those really important things, we go out in the world past the church and we do really important things, don't we? We help other people. We have jobs and we have really, we have really important role to play in the world. We are responsible for looking after the earth. All of those things are our, us being salt. But Jesus also says salt is good, <clears throat> but if the salt has lost its saltiness, with what will you flavour it? 
what is our saltiness? If we're salt and we go into the world and we do all those things, what is the saltiness that we take? What makes us salty? Anybody? Yeah, being a Christian, which is our faith in Jesus, isn't it? So just like he was salt, he helped people, he taught people, he healed people, and he died for us. So we take him with us into the world and he is what makes us salty. He is what makes us change the world. He is what makes us important in the world. So that's why it's important to come to church and read your Bible and pray to keep being salty to walk with Jesus. Now, there's something else that people have recently discovered salt is really good for. Do you know what it might be? You can even put salt in caramel chocolate now. So when you come and see me at the end of the service, I'm going to give you some chocolate with salt in it. All right? Okay. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, we thank you for being making us salty. Help us to keep connected to you. Help us to stay salty. Take us into the world, Lord, and make us the salt of the world. Make us important in the world. Make us bring you into the world to help bring it all back together again. Jesus, thank you. Amen. Stand for the greeting of peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We are the body of Christ. His spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you and also with you. Oh, yeah. Now, would you please be seated for the readings? The reading this morning is from James's letter, chapter 5, verses 12 to 20. And if you are looking in your pew Bibles, that's on page 1199. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. My brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring that person back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Hear the word of the Lord. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark, chapter 9, beginning at verse 38. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Now John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us and they were casting out demons in your name and we forbid them because he doesn't follow us but Jesus said do not forbid him for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me for he who is not against us is on our side for whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ assuredly I say to you he will by no means lose his reward But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone was hung around his neck and he was thrown into the sea. 
If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands or go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell, into that fire that shall never be quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good. But if the salt loses its flavour, how will you season it? Have salt in your souls and have peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May these words be heard and spoken in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please be seated? Now, in today's gospel, there are many what some might call exaggerations. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you've probably all laughed about um, exaggerated fishing stories <clears throat> about the one that got away, um, on especially how big it was. Well, I've got a couple of fishing stories myself, and some of them do involve my grandchildren, but they're not the stories I'm going to tell today. <laughs> and save a bit of embarrassment, <clears throat> probably mine rather than theirs. Um, well, one afternoon on the Bribey Ocean Beach, <clears throat> I'd been fishing and I'd caught four good-sized whiting and I had them behind me in a bucket. The bucket had some water in it and... I was fishing away and a man called my attention to the fact that a crow had just come down and stolen one of my fish. So I was not very happy, so I turned around and tipped the water out, took my fish and put my fish into my fishing bag that had, you know, all the bits and bobs that you have in a fishing bag, you know, spare hooks and sinkers and all that sort of thing. And I pulled out a takeaway container, plastic one. I had originally had the bait in it, but it was now probably in the bottom of the bucket or on the sand. But anyhow, I put my fish into this plastic container, the lid on and put it in the bottom of my fishing bag and then put all the other bits and bobs that were in there, pushed them all back to the fishing bag and then closed it and, and, you know, made sure it had something on top, maybe my thongs, I'm not sure. So I ventured down to the beach again. And around about now, because the fish had started, decided they were, you know, they'd had enough and they'd gone off and so fishing was a bit poor. And for some reason I turned around and had a look in my fishing bag and there beside my fishing bag was all the things that were in that, my fishing bag, including there was a bit of rope that I had. I'm not sure what I had that for, but it was always in there. And so you left it in there. There was a knife. There were a whole lot of things. They were all pushed out onto the sand. So I thought, rotten crows. So I went up to the bag. And there on the sand was my plastic um, takeaway container with a hole packed in the, packed in the top about that big. And the fish inside, at least one of them, had sort of lost its head and maybe a bit of a part of it. So not happy, Jan. So I thought, now how can I go home and tell Peter that I actually caught four good-sized whiting? He is not going to believe me. And even if I take home one or two, he's still a one and a half by this stage, I think. Maybe it was two and a half. So I ended up just throwing the fish out to the crows and thought, you are very resourceful birds. Unfortunately, you were stealing my dinner. But so I go home and I tell Peter, and he just looks at me and shakes his head. So, you know, that's my story. Whether 
I have exaggerated it a bit or not, it's up to you to think about and work out. But I wanted to talk to you because we live in a fishing area. I live in a fishing area now. So I thought it was appropriate to tell a story like that. And I think it would be safe to say that Jesus used many metaphors, double-edged sayings, paradoxes, and extreme comparisons when he taught his disciples. You could say he stretched the point a little to push home his message. And this text has several important points that can be hard to appreciate if we forget about the approach that Jesus took when he taught people. You see, he used irony and often biting, confronting humour. Here he suggests the extreme idea of mutilation and even death to overcome sin. If we look closely at the parable about losing a hand, foot or an eye, perhaps we can find a key to what Jesus is on about. Just suppose we are tempted to steal if we cut off one hand, would that stop us from stealing? Our desire comes from within. Sooner or later, we would still find ways to devise to steal. Computer crime can be done with one finger. Stock markets can be rigged over lunch. Corruption, fraud and graft only require clever minds and a few good connections and smile. You see, the loss of a hand would not stop us from stealing, and the same can be said if we were to run away from our problems or our responsibilities. Cutting off a foot would not stop our sitting by while someone else suffers for our inactions. The flaw lies not in the runaway feet but in the heart that motivates them. Now, suppose just by looking, we are tempted to lust, to desire what is not ours. Would that stop us? No, desire and greed come from inside of us. A physical disability will not stop us from doing the wrong thing. We can always find ways to steal other than by using our hands. We can always find other ways to run away from our responsibilities other than using our feet. And we can always find other ways to lust other than by looking with our eyes. Our self-seeking and self-indulgence comes from within. It comes from what is in our hearts. And you can be sure that Jesus wasn't exaggerating and pushing, he was exaggerating and pushing the point. He certainly wouldn't cancel amputation. Rooting out, rooting out the real flaws requires deep soul searching. You see, the reality is that it is the underlying issues inside of us that need amputation. It is by our own will that we are prevented from seeing, doing, and being the people of God. Now, Jesus told many stories to drive home the truth sometimes in subtle ways and sometimes in not-so-subtle ways. Now I'm going to tell you a modern, modern parable, and it goes something like this. On a dangerous coastline where shipwrecks often occurred, there was once a crude little life-saving station. The building was just a hut and there was only one boat, but the few devoted members kept a constant watch over the sea and with no thought for themselves went out day and night, tirelessly searching for those who were lost at sea. Some of those who were saved and others in the area wanted to become associated with the station to give their time, money and effort to support this work. New boats were bought and new crews were trained. The little life-saving station grew. But some of the members of the life-saving station were unhappy that the building was so crude and poorly equipped. They felt that more a more comfortable place should be provided as the first refuge for those who were lost at sea. They replaced the emergency cots with beds and put better furniture in their large building. 
Now the life-saving station became a popular greeting place for its members because they used it as a sort of club. They decorated it beautifully with exquisite carpets and furniture, and they painted windows that depicted their heroes and people sang songs about their most heroic exploits. Fewer members were now interested in going to sea on life-saving missions, so they hired lifeboat crews to do this work. The life-saving motif still prevailed in the club's decorations, and there was even a liturgical lifeboat in the room where the club initiations were held. Now, about this time, a large ship was wrecked off the coast and the hide crews brought in boatloads of cold, wet and half-drowned people. They were dirty, sick, smelly, and some of them had black skin and some had yellow skin. The beautiful new club was in chaos. So the property committee immediately had a shower block built outside the club where victims of shipwrecks could be cleaned up before they could come inside. And at the next meeting, there was a split in the club membership. See, most of the members wanted to stop the club's life-saving activities, saying that they were unpleasant and a hindrance to the normal social life of the club. Some members insisted that life-saving was their primary purpose and pointed out that they were still called a life-saving station but they were finally voted down and told that if they wanted to save the lives of all the different people who were shipwrecked in those waters, that they could begin their own life-saving station down the coast. And so they did. As the years went by, the new life-saving station experienced the same changes and challenges that, the, that had occurred in the old one. And it, involved, it evolved eventually itself into another club, and yet another life-saving life station was founded. Well, history continued to repeat itself, and if you wish, wish to visit that seaside coast today, you will find there's a number of exclusive clubs along that shoreline. Shipwrecks are frequently in those waters, but most of the people drown. Now, part of telling a good parable is that people should be able to understand it without any explanation, but I'm going to tell you the, the meaning anyway, just in case you missed it. In a way, uh, my modern day parable is about the same, similar to the same message that Jesus was on about today in our text. The life-saving station is the church. And in its members' efforts to improve the surroundings, the original purpose, the desire to save the lost, has disappeared amongst the concerns for the preservation of the club, those people who were like them. And in the final point of our text, Jesus uses another metaphor to describe what we should be like. He says we should be like salt, seasoning, flavouring and preserving life like the original reason for the first life-saving station. And most of us take salt for granted. We forget how necessary it is for survival and how valuable it is and can be to people who don't have any. Salt is as important as water for survival. It is essential to our diets, but in small amounts. We all know what it's like if we put too much on our food it becomes inedible and it can even make us sick if we use too much. If we use too much in making bread, it inhibits the yeast and the bread won't rise till its fullest potential. But if we don't use enough, then our food is bland and tasteless. Jesus again uses an ordinary everyday substance as an example of how we should be flavouring the world with God's love. Now, if we're too salty, if we're too noisy or too pushy, people back away. Our over-saltiness will inhibit the yeast of the Holy Spirit in people's lives. Jesus calls us to be the preserving salt and flavouring salt that seasons and assists the yeast to brew and rise in us. 
He calls us to discipline ourselves, or in the end, we will be disciplined. He calls us to cut out the parts that inhibit us and others from being people, the people we are called to be. So what are you, what do you taste like? What sort of seasoning are you? What parts need to be removed to bring life to others? How can you be the salt that helps the yeast of the Holy Spirit bring God's love alive in people and the, those around you? How can our life-saving station, our church, be that saving salt? Has our real purpose, the salvation of others, been lost because we have become comfortable with our worship, how we worship, our beautiful buildings, and for that matter, the like-mindedness of the people who come? Now, I know these are very hard questions and there's no easy answers. It's no secret that overall our church is lacking in several generations. Teenagers, children, 30s to 40s, and families are not in great abundance. If we can take just one thought away this morning, it would be that perhaps the pruning or the cutting off needs to be in our attitudes to the acceptance of difference and the openness to change. Now, I am mindful that with change comes fear. People are afraid that change will mean the tossing out of all the past and exciting and, and the things that they're really comfortable with. But for me, it means the affirmation of the past and the exciting possibilities and opportunities that God is laying here before us. It can mean the prospect of being great, being part of the creativity and act creative activity of the Holy Spirit. And it can mean being like that flavouring and preserving salt that Jesus invites us to be in the world. Let us pray. Creator God, through the incarnation of your Son, you showed us the way to live the way to eternal life. Lord, help us to remember our true purpose, our calling to reach out to the isolated, the rejected, and to love one another as you have loved us. Lord, put your salt in us. Amen. Let us now stand and make an affirmation of our faith and our beliefs. I believe I am, I need a shepherd because I am sometimes timid and other times overconfident because I often don't know the best path yet pretend I do because I rush into dead ends or lead others into hazardous places because my brightest ideas are seamed with darkness because the things I crave may not be what is good for me. I need a shepherd. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. His wisdom leads me to the optimum opportunities. His word comforts me when I am anxious or afraid. His arm steadies me when I feel weary and heavy laden. His wounded body displays the cost of my rescue. I believe in Jesus, the best possible shepherd. I believe that I do not find him, but he finds me, that I am under his care by virtue of great works. The love he gives me is to be shared with others, that he treasures my name and prepares a place for me, that his fold transfixes earth and heaven. I trust Jesus, the good shepherd. Amen. As we're here today, we remember those who are uh, in the Synod in, down in Brisbane, and we I'll say a special prayer for that at the start, and then I'll continue with the other intercessions. Almighty and ever-living God, give wisdom and understanding to the members of the Synod of this diocese. Teach them in all things to seek your first, first your honour and glory. May they 
perceive what is right, have courage to pursue it and grace to accomplish it. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Remember the situations in the, in Australia today. Remember the state of Victoria has just had a, a fairly drastic earthquake and a lot of people have been affected by that. And we uh, pray for those who have been affected by it that they may be protected. Let us also pray now for the preservation of the earth. We give thanks for the beauty and the abundance of the earth. Give us and all peoples grace to live in harmony with your creation, wisdom and generosity in our use of its bounty. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Let us pray for peace and shared prosperity. We live in a, a very rich country here in Australia, rich with so many resources. Let us remember those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We give thanks for the leaders who serve the common good, give wisdom to those who have the responsibility and authority in every land that we may share with justice the resources of the world and work together in trust. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our, our nation. We give thanks for this land and the diversity of its peoples. Grant that we may so honour one another that all may be enriched by our common heritage and freed from despair, poverty and exclusion. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Remember the church and its mission. We remember... At this, at this time, as the Synod is meeting, remember our Archbishop Philip, our Pastor Steve, and other members of our community there in the Synod session. We give thanks for the good news of salvation for all people. Strengthen us for our work in the world and empower your church to proclaim the gospel in service, word, and sacrament. Unite in the truth all who confess your name, that we may live together in love to your glory. Lord, in your mercy. Let us pray for ourselves and our community. And as we've just heard of caring for one another, being salt in our community, let us, we give you thanks for the fellowship of the communities in which we live and work. We commend to your keeping ourselves and each other, our families, those with whom we work and learn, our neighbours and our friends. Enable us to use, enable us by your spirit to live in love for you and for one another. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those who are in need. We remember our breakfast club and our food bank that has just commenced a few couple of weeks ago. Help us, Lord, to reach out to those in need, either known to us or unknown. We give thanks that you are the God who brings mercy and wholeness. Comfort and heal, we pray, all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or any other trouble. Give to those who care for them wisdom and patience and gentleness to us all your peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember today those who have passed on before us and we give, the, give you thanks for their lives. We give you thanks for your servants in every age. Grant that we, with all the saints, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your kingdom. And as, of, as our Father has taught us to say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. 
your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as on earth. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, all evermore. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also. <clears throat> peace of God be always with you. Please share the peace as you do. Anybody want to stand up and sing this beautiful song? Mm -hmm. 